Well, thank y'all. Uh, I'm here to introduce, please introduce uh, Andrew Shirley. Uh, he started working with me in the fall. He started, actually met me with two years ago at an ASB meeting, and he was interested in coming here for a master's, so he's here working on a master's thesis project. And this is kind of part two of what you heard from Johnny this morning. Uh, he uh, is working again with this uh, snail egg. I'm going to let him tell you a little, snail egg extract, and let him tell you a little bit about that. But he's taken a little bit further, and we were looking at uh, some of the things we'll do with reduction of toxicity with that snail egg toxin. So I'm going to let him take you through his project that he did, did this uh, fall. Thank you. So the title of my research is Reduction of Snail Egg Toxin-Induced Toxicity to Embryos of Xenopus legus. So we were kind of looking at an effect that the species of apple snail, the island apple snail, Ponomacea maculata, has on the environment, and specifically developing aquatic species. So, Palmacea maculata, or Palmacea insularum, depending on what text you read, uh, is an invasive species from South America, and they've come up into North America, into places like the Everglades in Florida, and the lower part of Alabama, so places like Mobile. They can cause different types of uh, ecological problems, so they will um, consume aquatic plants like rice, and that can cause uh, economic harm. Uh, they also cause water fouling, so through their excrement they actually make the water that they inhabit dirtier, and they will actually suffocate other organisms. But what we wanted to focus on was their eggs. So they reproduce very quickly. They'll lay, uh, when water levels are adequately low, they'll lay one egg clutch a week at, on average. And there are around 2,000 eggs for each clutch. And these eggs are covered and filled with uh, a protein that has been found to be not only unpalatable to species when they eat them, but also uh, they have a neurotoxic effect. So there were scientists who were feeding this uh, protein to mice, and they found that it caused paraplegia, so they lost the ability to use their back legs. And at higher concentrations, they just died. So we wanted to see what this protein would do to developing aquatic species that may not necessarily consume the eggs, but um, may be exposed to them because one method for controlling Palmacea maculata is to scrape the eggs off into the surrounding waters. So in order to test this, we use our uh, lovely test subjects here, uh, Xenopus labus, which is the African clawed frog. We use them because they are a model organism, so they're easy to raise in lab conditions. Uh, they can just basically be fed pelleted food. Um, and they can be bred at any point during the year uh, through the use of a hormone, chore a human chorionic gonadotropin. They're also very heavily studied in uh, cellular and molecular uh, labs. So we know a lot about their uh, genetics, we know a lot about how they work physiologically, and we can compare those results to other species, including humans. So what we did was we took egg samples from Palmacea insularum that were collected from Mobile, Alabama, and we homogenized that, basically broke up the eggs and the cells inside of them uh, using a Downs homogenizer. And we would centrifuge this extract that we got and diluted with VTAC solution, which is basically deionized water with salt ions added back in. And we spun that in a centrifuge at 3,000 revolutions per minute for 30 minutes. And this gave us a solid pellet, which was basically just the solid parts of the egg that we didn't want, and a supernatant solution that was protein and our FETAC solution. We then took half of that aliquot that we received, and we filtered it through a strong cation exchange column. And uh, all of the protein that we got, all of the supernatant that we got was frozen and then put into a freezer to use later. So then we bred our Xenopus labus, our clawed frogs, and we took the eggs that they laid and we looked for healthy, fertilized individuals, and we put them into groups of 20. And each group of 20 was placed into a petri dish, and each petri dish got a different concentration. It was either a control for, oh, which was just FETAC solution, or a snail egg protein extract that, uh, at different concentrations. We left them in these petri dishes for four days. We came back daily to check for uh, death, and we daily changed out their solutions just to make sure that we didn't have any buildup of other waste products that could cause uh, toxic effects. And so then we have our results. So this chart that's probably difficult to see from the back um, basically explains all of these uh, graphs together. 
So we have an EC50, LC50, MCGI, and TI for all of our uh, different uh, replicates. That's a lot of letters. So EC50 stands for effective concentration at 50%. So this is where we uh, project to see 50% of the tadpoles that we exposed to this egg protein would be malformed. And we see that, uh, that shown here in this graph. So what we see is that there's not really an increase from the control amount of uh, malformation. This toxin, though obviously still toxic, was not in filtered or unfiltered samples really a cause for uh, very many malformations. And we do see some malformations like over here, these are controls. Uh, this individual, these individuals have edema, so their head's a little swelled up. Uh, this one has a um, hemorrhage on its brain. And this one that was exposed to unfiltered protein uh, has both a sort of stunted tail. So instead of being long and drawn out like this, it comes out a little ways, it just kind of breaks off right there. And it also has an eye abnormality, so you can't really see the eye as well as you can in other uh, regular developing eyes. Uh, the next result that we have is the LC50. So that's the lethal concentration to 50% of the uh, population. So the LC50 was much lower in the uh, unfiltered protein extract replicates. So what we see is that we're losing some of this toxic effect when we send this protein extract through this strong ion exchange column. So that's this graph right here, I'm sorry. So the orange bars always represent our filtered protein, and the blue bars always, or blue lines always represent our uh, unfiltered protein. So you see that this line right here spikes much more quickly than the uh, filtered line does. Uh, the MCGI is minimum concentration to inhibit growth. So this is the lowest concentration that shows us that there's a decrease in the overall size at the fourth day of our experiment. So um, we see that there's a slight difference in so overall size between the filtered and unfiltered groups in general. But if you look at this, uh, the unfiltered line, or the filtered line, there's a sort of plateau period where we don't really see this decrease in size. Whereas in the unfiltered group, there is an instant decrease in size. So there are a couple of different reasons why we may be losing this toxic effect of this protein when we filter it through this column. One of them that's a little bit less likely is that this protein may not be abundant in, or greatly abundant in the egg, and we may just be filtering it out altogether while still having a high concentration of protein that doesn't show up when we check uh, after filtration. Uh, this isn't super likely. One thing that's, uh, one possibility that's more likely is that we may just be denaturing our protein. So instead of having the protein in the exact same form as it would be when it would be consumed by something else, we're basically ripping the protein apart and giving it a different shape. So it loses its effect. Something else that may uh, possibly be happening is we could be uh, pulling out something that complexes with this protein, so like a metal ion, something that could give it its toxic effect when it sticks together. So uh, the conclusions from this are basically that we can't necessarily use this uh, filtration method as something to purify our protein, but it does show that it's not just uh, any protein concentration that affects the death of these uh, developing frogs. It's something about our protein in these, uh, in the Palmacia insularum egg, Palmacia macularum egg, that is causing these developmental death. That's everything that I have. <laughs>